What's going on everyone? So today we had the much anticipated NVIDIA GTC quantum panel where there were many CEOs from quantum companies that came on with NVIDIA and CEO Jensen Huang to discuss the state of quantum today. I'm, I'm gonna be honest with y'all. This was, in my opinion, a missed opportunity. And we saw that reflected in the stock price, but it does show that there is a continuing PR and marketing problem at the top level of these quantum companies. One of the important things in any type of, especially a disruptive technology that's new, is that for people to take you seriously and for people, investors, or the general public, or tech in general, or other CEOs, or your peers, to take you seriously, you have to uh, be able to articulate things in a way that make sense to the the layman. Like we were, we we're talking at, at, in this in this upper stratosphere of deep quantum computing knowledge, and even me who makes quantum computer videos every day, my eyes are glossing over and I'm like, this isn't what people want to hear. We want to hear um, what is the business case? Where is it now? How is NVIDIA positioned to help quantum? And I think the stock price reaction was predictable. I think it was a fairly poor showing from um, our quantum leadership in general. And there was even some tense and awkward moments on stage. And I don't think uh, any of this was a grand slam or slam dunk or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I, I'm going to go into some of those uh, clips. We're going to do a react on those. And I'm just going to give you my thoughts. So what were some of the problems? One, they got too technical too fast. Imagine if NVIDIA went on stage and all they talked about was transistor efficiency instead of the larger business picture of AI dominance and AI demand. We need more of the business angle, the commercial angle, the use, the practical use cases. Where's the business case? Okay, that's that brings me to point number two. Where's the business case? Where's the application for quantum in the near term? Three, you're on NVIDIA stage. How can NVIDIA's, the best GPUs in the world, number three, they ignored the NVIDIA angle. So instead of aligning themselves with the biggest AI and computing company in the world, they acted like AI exists in a vacuum where really we know that GPUs, CPUs, and QPUs are most likely going to work together in the future. So this is an opportunity for more alignment, right? Um, number four, the stock price reaction was predictable. If you come out with kind of a weak showing, then the stock price is going to react in a weak way. So in general, down the line, we saw quantum sell-off. We saw D-Wave was down 18%, QUBT down 11%. They missed on earnings and they're down even more after hours. LAES, down 10%, Rigetti down 9%, even Ion Q, who had an announcement this morning, down 9%. So we can see that the sentiment with these stocks is all interconnected. So there's a sensitivity that investors have to these type of events, especially when there's so many eyes on an event. It becomes an opportunity. And my argument is, that today was a missed opportunity. We're gonna go into some of the sound bites and exactly why. Once again, a shout out to Will Rich. I searched the internet far and wide for a live stream and Will Rich on YouTube, once again, was at the, the forefront of Quantum News. He was live streaming this event. I think at one point he had up to 6,000 concurrent viewers, which is pretty huge. Um, for quantum and it was a highly anticipated event that 
was disappointing. So credit to Will Rich. I think there's some sync and audio issues with the clips that I'm going to show, but I have captions turned on and it's timestamped and we're just going to rip through these. So let's, uh, let's dig in. Each one of, and I, I just say since 1995, it's amazing how many different modalities have showed up, free qubits and the amount of progress that's been made. Uh, so it's really quite exciting from that, that point of view. Um, and it's great to see the leading companies on stage here today with us, so. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Alan, go ahead. Thanks, Jensen. So uh, we are a superconducting company, similar to Rigetti. Uh, we believe that superconducting provides the best balance between qubit fidelity or the quality of the qubits and gate speeds, time to compute. But we're actually quite unique from everybody else on this panel and pretty much everybody else in the industry because we use annealing technology as opposed to gate model technology. Um, without going into the details, annealing is a much easier technology to work with. It's easier to scale. It's much less sensitive to noise and errors. And probably the best uh, proof point for that was in a paper that we published in Science last week. So we'll uh, put up the stock chart next to What's really interesting about watching the markets and especially individual stocks is you're getting a real time report card of how you're doing. So um, during this speech um, and during this panel, we actually saw the market reacting in real time to the information. I think investors were really looking for clarity. There's been a lot of hype. There's been a lot of uh, positive news and positive sentiment that's been building. And investors want to cut through that and they want to know what is exactly happening. And I don't think that investors got that clarity. I think they got a lot of technicals. They got a lot of uh, industry jargon. And we really need to frame things in an accessible way that the average person could walk away from it and be like, okay, I see the purpose of an NVIDIA GPU. And now I understand how a quantum computer I understand how a quantum computer could be uh, used to enhance our overall compute ability. I think it's a big optics problem for the whole industry. And then even on stage, you'll see in a later clip that uh, that there's some tension between Alan and Jensen. And I'll point that out. Let's let's go to the next clip. Can be the ultimate instrument for understanding the basic sciences that affects that industry. However, because it was described as, an, as a quantum computer instead of a quantum instrument, people have a, mo a notion about what a computer is. You know, you should be able to run Excel super fast. <coughs> and and you, know that, you know that every, every respect, respectable computer should be able to run Crisis, the game. And, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a common sense about what a computer is, and that's attached to memory, it's attached to network, it's got storage, it should be able to read and write, and there's a programming model associated with a computer that I wonder, I wonder if it's just a wrong, wrong mental model. And as a scientific instrument, it's extraordinary, Mikhail, as, as you say, and that the opportunity to... Jensen's saying here, I think it's pretty important because we all have a preconceived notion of what a computer is and a quantum computer is fundamentally different than any computer we've ever used. The purposes, the applications are different. And so it's an education gap. It's a void and just widespread general knowledge and understanding it, it. What is it? A better iPhone? Is that what a quantum computer is? Like we we're, we're in this, panel, we're talking at level 600, when we really need to bring it back to the 101, 102, 103, and make this more accessible so people can understand. Going with the concept. Um, I, I don't know how to think of a quantum computer as an instrument when it's being used for materials discovery, when it's being used for blockchain, when it's being used NTT Docomo to improve cell tower resource utilization. I mean, it's true that there are many applications I would never try to run on a quantum computer. But 
for applications that require extensive processing power, these machines are very powerful. So this is starting to get into the meat of it where there's some tension and Alan's looking right at, well, they're, they're, this is like a wild west. Uh, there's probably a tumbleweed uh, going between them right now. There's some tension. So this interaction and what they said was pretty telling. And, and let's, let's look at it a little bit closer. Sorry. I'll jump in. It's, on a, it's okay. Yeah. I'll jump in on that. I was, I was actually just trying to help. Okay. It's a, it's I'm, okay. I'm going to ro ro yeah. rewind 10 seconds. I was, I was actually just trying to help. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me rewind just a little bit more. Many here. applications I would never try to run on a quantum computer. But for applications that require extensive processing power, these machines are very powerful. And I think go well beyond just instrumentation or measurement. Sorry. I'll jump in. It's, on a, it's okay. Yeah. I'll jump in on that. I was, I was actually just trying to help. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, we saw your help. You okay, we got to stop right there. That A lot was said in four seconds, okay? So Jensen, so Jensen says, I'm sorry, I was just trying to help. And then Alan claps back, we saw your help. The last time Jensen made a comment about quantum computers, 60% of the market cap was wiped off. We, we learned today that Jensen didn't even understand that there were publicly traded quantum computer companies. Um, and uh, there were times where, I hate to say it, but Jensen was a little cheeky. Um, it didn't seem like he was taking, it didn't seem like he was taking uh, the, the content very seriously um, or listening or respecting the opinions of the people he invited on stage. So there's some dysfunction uh, from that level, right? From the level of, and, and we hear the audience laugh, like he looks at the audience and kind of r rolls his eyes a little bit uh, like, oh, I was just trying to help. Or measurement. Sorry. I'll jump in. It's, on a, it's okay. Yeah. I'll jump in on that. I was, I was actually just trying to help. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we. Like that kind of look over to the audience, like, you, you, know, you guys see this guy? Like, this is his conference. This is his show. He's the CEO of one of the biggest companies in the world. Um, and and Alan is, is one of the only CEOs, once again, that is up there challenging the status quo. And why are we seeing both of these guys uh, – do they ever have a conversation, not in front of a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand uh, people that are hanging on every word they say? Can they have a conversation behind closed doors and understand? Oh, this is how we can help each other. This is uh, this is the the future, right? Like I, I don't know if there's a lack of desire to communicate or or what's going on, but uh, I, I thought this interaction was was very interesting. Somebody asked me, so what's accelerated computing good for? And I said, I said um, uh, a long time ago, because I was wrong, uh, that, that this is, this is going to replace computers. This is going to be the way computing is done. We also announced with NVIDIA, AWS, and AstraZeneca a 20x improvement in a chemistry application. What's amazing about it is that we did that on 36 qubits, our existing system today. By the end of the year, we will have 64 qubits. Every time you add a qubit, you double the computational power. So that's two to the 28th increase in a single generation of chip, which is roughly 260 million times more powerful. Okay. This incredibly, incredible science that's happening here, and that's an incredibly bullish statement in isolation, but it's just, it's lost in the execution here. Like, uh, as investors digest this, they need to pay attention to those details. This is not a linear curve anymore. We have companies saying exponential increase in power. We're already 20Xing. We're already got to pay attention to those details in these type of uh, panels and sessions. Well, th there's already a magnitude of progress, but at the same time, there are problems that are just 
you know, impossible to solve classically today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are problems in the area of drug discovery. There are problems in the area of global weather modeling. But even just the application that I shared, um, which is the basis of our paper a week ago, which is computing properties of materials. You know, we use Frontier, which is basically one of your systems, massively parallel supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Lab, and would take millions of years to perform the computation. So the point is, there are still hard computational problems that are out of the reach of classical. And AI isn't going to address those problems either. Good, good, strong, direct messaging. This was, if we looked at a pie chart, if, if all the CEOs or quantum had this approach, this would have been a very different reaction, okay? Uh, so Alan's talking about AI. He's talking about the fact that our current computers will not be able to solve these problems, simply will not, hard stop. And Jensen's saying, well, what about the progress of, that there's still runway for the progress of, of CPUs and GPUs. So is, are we seeing a collision of old, it's, it's hard to, it's insane to say this because uh, NVIDIA has always been a disruptor themselves, but wouldn't they be the first to recognize a disruptive technology and jump on? And it's interesting to see this tension here. They're just yeah, right. out of the- I, I was just gonna say, we use um, your GPUs to design our chips to often do co-simulation to make sure that the quantum computers are working. It's a, um, when we look to the future for uh, quantum computing, it's going to be a set of classical systems sitting right next to a quantum computer. There we go. We needed more of this. We needed more of this. I think this is a guy from IonQ. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but uh, this is the CFO, I believe, of IonQ. I'm not familiar exactly with uh, his name. Um, but he's saying, we use your systems already. There is going to be a combination of both of these tools in the future. Back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't something where one is replacing the other. They're working together. Which is what NVIDIA and all these companies should do. These quantum companies, NVIDIA, they should be working together. Okay, so this was the last part of the speech, and Jensen says, okay, let's go around where okay, we're going to be in a year. Have, I like this question a lot. Very quick. Just have, we just have to be very quick. Next year, this time, what are we going to be talking about? And so, so let's just quickly go through. Go ahead, Alan. Next year, this time, what, what do you hope that we're talking about? So I remember it. How, how quantum is helping you to do better, better model training and inference with lower power consumption. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, uh, oh man, I mean, <laughs> all right, so, so Alan said on CNBC, okay, so we, we just have to, we have to look at a track record, record at this point, um, so Alan's taking on one of the top three CEOs in the world, he's not intimidated, he's not phased, He's saying it like he it, like it is. He's speaking directly to the to the man himself and saying how it's going to help you. Um, I want to I want to listen to this one more time. Go ahead, Alan. Next year, this time, what what do you hope that we're talking about? So I remember it. How how quantum is helping you to do better better model training and inference with lower power consumption. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. And and he's not wrong because. AI data centers need entire power plants to run right now. So if quantum can help reduce power and solve problems faster, why wouldn't you want to work together? Why wouldn't you want to work towards that future? 